Welcome to Gainesville Church, everybody. Would you all stand? We're going to sing and praise Jesus' name this morning. Come on, let's get up and praise him. Let's do this together. I serve. Oh, when I search the world, and it couldn't fill me, commands and praise and treasures of faith are never enough. Oh, that you gave it all And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, we sing there's nothing Oh, there's nothing Turn praise into glory. You turn 
Church is saying, I see joy rising. I see joy rising. I hear hope calling. I see fear hiding. I hear chains falling. I see walls shaking. I hear doubt running. It's my God's on his way. Yes, he is coming. I see joy rising. I hear hope calling. shame disappears now here now here I stand undefeated when Jesus is here now here now here now here in his presence my shame disappears now here now here and I stand undefeated Oh, 
bow your heads and pray with me this morning, church. Lord Jesus, we celebrate that your presence is here in this room. We celebrate the words of this song, the work you did on the cross, the work you did in that grave. You rose and saved us from sin. Lord God, we look forward to Easter this year. That's truly what it's about. So I pray we wouldn't forget that work you did for us in our lives. So God, work in our hearts this morning. Change us to be better people. Help us to love you and know you more. So we thank you so much. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Morning, church. Really? Good morning, church. I heard more from our online folks out there than I did from you the first time. So good morning to all of you on this great Sunday. I've got a couple of connection opportunities. We don't do announcements here at this church because announcements usually specify just a small group of people. These are connection opportunities that apply to most of us. The first one is our mission auction. And I'd like to say what I say a couple of weeks in advance. This is not something that you come to to find bargains. This is an auction to support mission teams that go out all over the world. And so we want you to overspend on these auction items because you know what you're doing is you're supporting us being the hands and feet of Christ in places like Ethiopia, Romney, West Virginia, Winchester, Honduras, all of these things that we do in this church we do to be the hands and feet of Christ. And this auction is a very important thing. It raises a great deal of money. So save the date. It's March 4th, 6 p.m. And oh, by the way, it is big hair 80s themed. Okay? So maybe you want to go out and buy a wig if you don't have big hair like they did in the 80s. Think about some of those movies and the hair that those women had. It is the 80s theme, save the date. It's a great time if you have auction items that you might be able to donate or you know someone that might donate to the church, please get those into Burt Miller as soon as possible. Secondly, we have a new member class coming up. This is where you get to come and be with the pastors, Benson and myself, and we will sit down and we'll talk with you about Gainesville Church. We'll give you an opportunity to talk about yourselves because we really like to get to know you. And also, we do it when we have enough people. Why do we do that? Because we want you to get to know other people. They may be from another service. They might be people that you don't know from this service. It's an opportunity for you to get to know about the church and to get to know about one another, and then you get to pepper Benson and I with questions. Just anything you want to ask. Anything. Anything goes. So we are going to have that starting next Sunday afternoon, and that is going to be the 29th, it's going to be at 4 p.m. in the lobby right out there, and it's going to be a time for you to get to know the pastors and to get to know one another. It's going to be on the 29th and the 5th of February. 29th and 5th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And then finally, you may have noticed the FedEx truck out there in the parking lot. I'm, I'm sorry, I've been around here since Feeding Friends started, and it looks to me like a FedEx truck that's got a logo on it. Well, it is exactly that. It's a redecorated, reinvented FedEx truck that is for our Feeding Friends ministry. And Ann Rislick, who is one of the founders, is going to talk to you about that. Thanks, John. Good morning. Morning. Um, the FedEx truck's name is Mildred. So let's be clear, Mildred is the truck. Um, so Kevin and I started Feeding Friends in 2016. And we get together on Tuesday afternoons and we make bag lunches. And then we load up Mildred. Uh, with all the supplies that are donated here from the church. And we head over to, off of Ashton Avenue, to the Manassas Presbyterian Church parking lot, and we park Mildred next to the drop-in center that's there. Um, like I said, it's off of Ashton, it's right behind Costco, so it's a really great kind of central location. 
And so we give out items to the homeless and, and chat with them a little bit. And so we always need things, right? We need donations, we need volunteers. There's a few things we don't need. We don't need your teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. We also don't need your three-piece suit from the 80s. You can wear that to the auction. Um, but that's not what we need. So if you're thinking of living outside in the woods, in a tent, maybe not in a tent, day after day after day, what would you need to survive? Those are the types of items that we need. So we're looking for warm coats. If you have a serviceable coat that you may not use all the time, think about donating it. If you have a pair of sneakers you've worn, but they have some life left in them, that type of thing. We need donations all year long. So when it comes to summer, when you're getting your summer stuff out, you have a few extra t-shirts, we can use those types of things. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit today about the philosophy of feeding friends. So it's a Tuesday afternoon. We've packed our meals, we've packed up Mildred, we've driven over, we're parked next to the drop-in center, we're open for business. We have our first uh, friend come up. He's new. He's not been to feeding friends before. So he gets up to the back of Mildred and one of our volunteers says, hey, how are you? How can we help you? What can we get you today? And he's a little uncomfortable. He's not been there before. You know, he's not really sure what we have to offer him. And so a volunteer says, hey, how about a pair of socks? You can always use a fresh pair of socks when you live in the woods. And he says, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, a pair of socks would be great. Volunteer gives him the socks. Anything else we can get for you today? No, no, I'm, I'm good. Socks are great. Okay, well, no problem. Why don't you grab a meal, feeding friends made, and uh, go see the folks at the drop-in center. So he, he takes the socks, he goes and he gets his meal, and he kind of looks around, and he hits it. He leaves. Next week, he comes back. Comes up to Mildred. Hey, what can we get you today? Good to see you again. Um, I, my flashlight is not working. I think its batteries are dead. You guys have batteries? We do. We have AAA, AA. Help him get his flashlight working, click it, good. Um, can we get anything else today? No, that, that, that's all I need today. Okay, well, why don't you grab a meal? Say hi to the drop-in center folks. He goes over, he gets his meal. He sees a friend from the street that he knows sitting in the chair over by the drop-in center. So he takes his meal and he sits down next to his friend and they open their bag lunch made by feeding friends and they're eating their lunch and a drop-in center volunteer comes out, sits down. Hey, I don't remember you from before you knew. Yeah, I'm new. Um, well, you know, what's going on? And they have a conversation. Where are you staying? What are you seeing out there? What do you need? And he opens up a little bit, starts to talk about his life a little. And the drop-in center volunteer says, you know, we have some on-county staff here from Prince William County. We have an outreach worker. And he might have some resources for you that could help you. Um, would you be interested in talking to him? The guy says, um, okay. I'll talk to him, and that's it, success. We have helped someone that did not have any resources, or there are very few resources. Get connected to resources. And where did all of that start? Started with a pair of socks. A pair of socks and a smile from feeding friends. A pair of socks that opened a door that led to a path that led to their future. And what does that future look like? It looks like different for everybody, just like us. It may be re reaching out to a social worker or a mental health professional. It may be getting connected to SNAP, which is food stamps, or Medicaid for healthcare or a prescription they may need. It may be housing down the road, shelter down the road. It may be getting an ID. You'd be surprised how many people we see that have no ID. It's either been lost or stolen throughout the years, or they never have had one. Helping them through that process of the cost and just the process of starting over um, to get that ID is huge. You cannot get a job without an ID. Not possible. Getting an ID opens a lot of opportunities. And where did all those opportunities start? With a pair of socks and a smile from feeding friends. So consider stopping out at the uh, connection table when you leave the service today to see how you might be able to help us out. Thanks. Thanks, Ann. Before Benson comes up and brings us what I know is going to be a great message, let's bow our hearts and heads in prayer. Lord God, you are in this place because you caused that pair of socks to be donated and that smile to be given. 
You're in this place because I invited you yesterday and the day before and the day before, and you always fulfill those promises that when we ask you to be present with us, you are. So be present here today, O oh God. Be present in the words that Benson is going to say. Be, fill him with your spirit. And Lord, may hearts and lives be transformed by Jesus Christ today. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, John. Our scripture this morning comes to us from Paul's first letter to Timothy, the first chapter. I'm going to start reading in verse 12. It says this, I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a, a, a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who had come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So this morning, um, we continue our talk all about, our sermon series, all about authenticity, discovering who we actually are. We've talked about not comparing. We've talked about where our identity comes from. Today, we talk about this issue uh, of flaws that we all have. Uh, so I thought we would start this morning by playing a game. I love playing games on Sunday mornings. I think it's a great time to play a game. So I invented this game. Uh, I feel like it's really good. It's a very simple game. I want everyone to play. Uh, it's forced family fun here, so whether you want to play or not, you're playing. Uh, I have titled this game, very simple title, nothing too creative here. I've titled the game, Raise Your Hand If You're Perfect. So uh, the rules of the game, super simple, super simple. The rules of the game are you raise your hand if you're perfect. That's the whole game, actually. So I feel like everyone knows how to play. I don't need to re-explain that at all. So again, we're going to play the game, raise your hand if you're perfect. When the game starts, you raise your hand if you're perfect. If you're not perfect, you keep your hand down. Do Are we all tracking? Okay, let's play. Raise your hand if you're perfect. Good, good. This is what I thought was going to happen. I actually worried what would I would do if someone did raise their hand. That has yet to happen, so good. Uh, but this is what I love. This is what I love about people. Uh, if you ask anybody if they're perfect, they are very quick to tell you they are, in fact, not perfect. That's great. Good start. When you then ask people to start talking about their flaws, they are much slower to name those and to talk about them if they're even willing to talk about them at all. Right? There's this great disconnect. If, if we can keep it general enough, like, are you perfect? Everyone goes, oh, of course I'm not perfect. And then we say, name your flaws. Everyone's like, oh, uh, uh, it's going to take some time. Why is this? Right? Why is this? Well, first I think we have to think about the word flaws, which I picked very intentionally, because uh, it covers a, a wide range of thoughts and ideas. Because we know, we know that there's things in our lives that we call sin, things that are against God, things where we miss the mark, things where we've, uh, we've taken action or thoughts or said things to our neighbors or our friends or family, whoever it might be, that we know are wrong against God. We call that sin. Then uh, there's this concept. It comes to us from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 9, but it's actually throughout all of the Old Testament. It's unintentional sin. Israel had this time when the high priest would make sacrifices to receive God's forgiveness for unintentional sin, or sin that people were committing that they didn't even realize was sin. So, so we have sin in our life we know about. We have sin in our life we don't know about. And then uh, we also all have certain weaknesses that are much harder to identify uh, as easily. And so, uh, like right now, our whole staff, uh, I am making them take every personality test known to mankind. 
We're going Enneagram. We're doing disc inventory. We're doing love languages. We're doing Myers-Briggs. Like, you name it, we're taking it. And I am just, like, bathing in this experience. Like, yes, yes, introvert, extrovert. Tell me how you think about things. I love doing stuff like this. Some, some people are totally on board with it. There are personalities that hate personality tests, so they, of course, hate the whole process, and that's fine. Uh, but what I love when, we, when you do this work is it will always tell you what you're good at. It will always tell you your strengths, the things that you bring to the table just because of your personality, how you interpret the world, how you make decisions. Uh, and there's always a second column, though, which is uh, your weaknesses. And there's not a personality out there that you take the test and it goes like bing, 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 jackpot. Like your only strengths, you have no weaknesses, right? Every personality out there comes with weaknesses, things that are just inherently built into us that uh, are a sort of inverse reflection of our strengths. So uh, like some of my strengths are I'm a bit of a tenacious person. I'm full of energy. I like see a challenge. I'm like a dog with a bone. Give me enough time, give me enough resources. I believe any problem can be overcome. That side of my personality uh, is I can be a bit overbearing or uh, people can feel like I'm not as in tune with my emotions as I should be and I'm making too logical of decisions or I'm just like, let's do it! And everyone else is like, I'm not ready for this, right? That's a weakness that I have. And so our flaws, our flaws cover this huge spectrum of sin, unintentional sin, all the way down to just weaknesses that we might have based on our personality. And the challenge with all of this is that we have been conditioned over time, conditioned by family or how we grew up, the environment we grew up in, we have been conditioned to hide or bury these aspects of ourselves. We, we have been taught to not share our weaknesses, to not share our flaws, but to present ourselves as if we are perfect, even though none of us will raise our hand to say we're perfect. The result of this sort of constant burial of flaws and, and challenges in our lives and why it affects our ability to live authentically and be who we truly are is because when we begin to do this, we build up, we build up shame and guilt in our lives. We begin to just poison our spirits, we poison our souls with shame and guilt because we know that there are weaknesses, we know that there are problems, but we don't have a space or an environment or people to talk through them with or feel like we can even share them with. As that shame and guilt builds up, it begins to express itself in incredibly unhealthy ways. Right? So generally in life, the thing that people get the most upset with is the thing they hate most about themselves. I was just talking to somebody after our 8 o'clock service, and they were like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Like at work, if someone is late to any deadline, I get so angry, and then I'm literally late to every deadline. Sometimes people uh, see the worst of themselves in others. Like sometimes this manifests itself in the church, and like if you follow national church news, I don't know why you would, but John and I do because we're weirdos. Uh, right? Like there's always a pastor who's in trouble, and the thing they're in trouble for is the very thing that they were like just railing against in like the previous week's sermon. You know, like you need to practice financial responsibility, and then they get caught with like embezzlement. Right? It's like, there's, like, we always express the thing we dislike about ourselves in judgment to others. And when we begin to do what eventually happens, what eventually happens is that it puts a block on our ability to grow as people. Through the burying of our flaws, the shame and guilt and the judgment of others, 
we aren't able to actually grow beyond any of those things. And so we're left with the question, well, what do I do about that? And that's what brings us to our scripture this morning. Because Paul, of all people, throughout the course of, his, of human history, is basically like the world's greatest evangelist. What that means is like nobody since Paul or before Paul was as good at bringing people to Jesus as Paul was. He plants church after church after church after church. He raises up leaders who then go out and share the gospel with people. He's constantly sharing the gospel with people. He has a whole tree of people under him who are all sharing the gospel and bringing people to Jesus. And basically, through his ministry, he spreads news of Jesus Christ throughout the entire known world at the time. Like No one is better at Paul, than Paul uh, at spreading the good news of Jesus. And so it's this person who we might think, like, oh, I bet they're super holy. Like, I bet they're just, like, I, no one is as good as them. It's Paul, as he's spreading the gospel, who speaks like this to his church and to the people who follow him. He says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. In other words, Paul, who's super good at ministry, super good at talking about Jesus, super good at living for Jesus, and super good at connecting to others, is not only not presenting himself as perfect, but is, in fact, totally comfortable in sharing his faults and his mistakes and the things that like are totally against the gospel that he was doing. And so what you actually find out is uh, the way we live our lives, the way we've been taught or trained to live our lives, to hide our mistakes, is unhealthy, and that actually life is far healthier and better for us when we find ways to share our flaws. The first thing we discover about ourselves is that when you are comfortable in not just admitting but sharing your flaws, that you will become a far less judgmental person. It's easy to judge others when we try and treat ourselves as perfect. It's much harder to judge others when we understand that we, too, are not perfect. Jesus says it this way. He says it in multiple Gospels, but I'm going to read from Matthew this morning. So this is Matthew 7. I'm going to start in verse 3. One of my favorite passages in Scripture. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye, while a log is in your eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. In other words, even when Jesus is doing ministry to today, people were looking at each other, and they were finding the slightest thing wrong with somebody else. Like, I mean, can you imagine how hard you'd have to stare at somebody to like see if they had a piece of sawdust in their eye, that would be such an uncomfortable moment, right? But, but like, but Jesus is saying, like, you are willing to like stare at this person down, stare them down, just to see if there's a speck wrong. Meanwhile, you have a whole tree trunk coming out of your face, right? Like, I don't know if you've ever seen a log, but they're quite large. I don't know how a log fits into an eye. If there was a log, it would just kind of like encompass my whole face, if not more. And I have a pretty big head, right? Jesus is like, you guys can't even see us, Beth. Because there's a tree trunk coming out of your face. So, shocking idea here. Why don't you move the tree trunk? We are so judgmental 
Because we don't even know there's a tree trunk in our things. If we admit our flaws, realize, hey, I've got to take care of this acorn tree or redwood or however big of a tree is in your face. It's way easier to have some patience and some grace for your friend slash frenemy with a speck in their eye. When you begin to admit your flaws, to share your flaws, you will become a less judgmental person. The second thing is this. You will become more relatable. Why does Paul, when he's sharing all about this, feel a need to say these words? Verse 16. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. Now, I'm going to have some confession time here for you and to live eternally on the internet. I feel like you will relate to me, but you will sit there silently because of how well you will relate to me. I don't know about you, but do you have a person in your life and like you kind of meet them for the first time and you're like, oh, that person. They're like super kind, super patient, seem like they have it all together, absolutely nothing is wrong with them. And like, just when you think you're gonna find something wrong with them, they like surprise you and they're like, I'm the kindest, happiest person in the whole wide world. And inside, you're like, you're like, oh, gross, I hate that person. <laughs> right? I have these thoughts. Like, I can't stand that person when I first meet them because I'm like, oh, they're too good. You know? Like, I like a little roughness to the people I'm around. Like some real chips on the shoulder. Similar to the size of the chips and roughness of my shoulder, right? One of my best friends in seminary was this way. When I first met him, I could not stand him. Because I was like, oh my gosh, you love Jesus too much. Like, like you're, like, you're just way too into this. Like, I cannot deal with you. And then, this is, this is the truth. Over time, I got to know him. The more I knew him, guess what? The more I discovered he had problems too. And do you think our friendship fell apart when I discovered he had problems? No. In fact, our friendship grew and got deeper because we could relate to each other on issues that we were struggling with. When we have flaws and others share their flaws, we begin to relate. Think about the people in your life who might be desperately in need of a relationship, and what they need from you is to understand that while you might be growing with God, while you might be letting Jesus change your life and make you better and better, you are still not perfect. When we begin to admit our flaws, we become infinitely more relatable. And when we become infinitely more relatable, we put ourselves in a position for God to use us, not just to change us, but to relate to others and bring them along on the change of life that we experience through Jesus Christ. So the question becomes, if not sharing my flaws is bad, Sharing my flaws is good. How do I share my flaws in a healthy way? Because let me be very clear. Here's what I am not telling you to do this morning. Do not tweet. Do not make an Instagram story. Do not post on Facebook. Do not write a letter to all of your neighbors. Do not send a mass email to your coworkers saying, hey, just heard a sermon from my pastor. And here are the 10 things about me that I absolutely hate that I want you to know about. No. Bad. I'm not telling you to do that. We have to find ways to share our flaws in healthy, constructive ways. The first of which I believe is when we talk about our flaws, we always use the word struggle. Always use the word struggle. And that's because when you can talk about your flaws as a struggle, it implies and sends the implication that you are not okay with your flaw and you are trying to grow from it. 
Because though we all have flaws, and even though God can use our flaws, that is not an excuse for us to not grow as people. Right? There's this phrase out there, um, depends on who you're talking to, and, and uh, sometimes it comes up in dating, sometimes it comes up in friendships, but it goes something like this, like, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best, right? Has anyone ever heard that? I love that phrase, and everything I'm going to say is not my own idea. I'm totally stealing it, but this is when it all clicked for me. Uh, but someone's like, can you imagine if we said that in any other environment, right? Like, if you got on a plane, and the pilot was like, hey, everybody, uh, we're about to take off. We got a 14-hour flight to Australia, and just so you all know, uh, I'm going on one hour of sleep, my relationship with my wife is in tatters and my children all hate me, but if you can't have me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best, all right, buckle up, flight attendants, prepare for takeoff. You would be like, get me off this plane. Or if you were going into surgery and your doctor was like, hey, uh, funny story, I was actually traveling yesterday and um, got kind of caught up in some traffic and uh, I haven't slept today. Also, I got a weird cramp and pain in my hand, but you know what? If you can't have me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best, right? This is, uh, I'm saying that is not the approach we take to our flaws. You do not get to be like, here are my flaws. If you can't have me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. No, we speak about our flaws in a way that says we are struggling with them because we're not okay with them and we are trying to grow from them. Two, find the correct space to share your flaws. Find the correct space and the correct time to share your flaws. One of those spaces, I'm telling you right now, is Christian community. Find people in your life who also love Jesus that you can share your flaws with, who will encourage you, who will pray for you, who will hold you accountable, and will share their flaws back with you. But also, find space in the relationships with the neighbors, coworkers, friends you have who don't know Jesus, who build that relationship, and when conversation becomes deeper and deeper and more serious and more serious and trust is built, you will have created the space to begin to share your flaws. And when you do that, I promise you, God will use you in that moment and make you and the gospel and a relationship with Jesus far more easy. And finally this, always, 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 Share your flaws with a mindset of growth. Right? Paul grew beyond a vast majority of his flaws. He didn't speak about them in a way that was like, this is exciting and awesome, right? He didn't say like, oh man, you should have heard the, I spoke about God. Like, there was no one better at insulting the Lord than me. He didn't say when he was persecuting the church, like, you should have seen how many Christians I threw in jail. And when he was talking about being a man of violence, because there's cases of him stoning people in scripture, he wasn't like, you should have seen how fast and how accurate I could chuck a stone. No, like, we don't talk about our flaws in a glorified way. We talk about our flaws in a way of growth, and we can even share them once we've grown beyond them. And yet there are other flaws Paul talks about, specifically in 2 Corinthians verse 12, or chapter 12, where he refers to it as a thorn in his side that he prayed over and over and over and over again for God to take care of. And yet ultimately God, what God did was not remove the thorn or the flaw, but simply said, my grace is sufficient. In your weakness, I will be made strong. We always talk about our flaws with a mindset of growth. Because here's the thing. You are not perfect. I am not perfect. There is not a person in this room or on this world right now that I would say is perfect. And yet the thing that makes us not perfect is not something to be ashamed of. 
The thing that is keeping you from perfection is not something to feel guilt over. But in God's infinite love and goodness, he has found a way to not only enable you to grow beyond that thing, but to use our brokenness as people to relate to others so that they too might know Jesus and be saved. And that is a beautiful thing. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Almighty God, we love you. We praise you. Father, I pray your spirit would be upon us. Allow us to surrender our hearts to you, to know our flaws, and while we long to grow past them, allow us to equally give them over to you, to be used by you, to connect with others, to realize whatever our struggles are in this world, there's probably somebody we know who shares that struggle and is in need of support. Father, allow us, free us, free us from the temptation of presenting ourselves as perfect. Let people see our chips, our rough spots. Not so that they would be okay with their flaws, but so that they know there is a God who loves them and is there for them and longs for them to know him. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, I want to invite um, a very special member of our church up. Uh, Alvin Dilling is not only one of our board members, which means, again, this is the person you go complain about me to, uh, or Pastor John. You only have a few more months to complain about Pastor John, so get it, just let it out. Um, don't do that. <laughs> but Alvin is also our church lay leader, which means he is the top non-pastor in our church. He has been here a long time and a good, good, faithful member and man of God here to speak to us about our stewardship. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Benson. I've attended Gainesville Church for the past 18 years. When I moved from Denver to Virginia, I was looking for a church that was a mission church and had a diverse congregation. And I ended up here, thank God. And during my first four months, I went on my first mission trip, and that was gleaning. We had several adults and young people. And during that day, we gathered over 2,500 pounds of apples that we gave to charitable organizations. And so it showed me then that this church was the hands and feet of Christ. And we can only do that based on your generosity as a congregation. My personal story about giving briefly is this. I'm a lifelong Methodist, and I began giving to the church when I was a young child. If you can believe that, I was young at one time. Anyway, when I was six years old, I was sitting in church with my siblings, and both parents were in the front of the church in the choir loft singing in the adult choir. And they used to pass around collection plates at that time. And I noticed that some of the adults on the road that we were sitting in, they would put like a bill in the plate and then they take one out. They apparently were making change, like you put in $20 and then you take back five. So, I had my little doll and I'm getting ready to put it in there. And as if my mother had X-ray vision and mind reading capabilities, she looked at me with that look. That look said, boy, you better not even think about taking money out of that plate. So I froze like that, I mean, and so I, found, I put the dollar bill in there and I sat still for the rest of the service because I know there's gonna be the conversation when we get home. So the conversation was, well, Mom, why were these people taking bills out of the plate? I thought I knew better. She said, well, they were just, they didn't have you know, the, the amount that they wanted to give, so they were just getting change back. But that doesn't apply to you. I said, yes, ma'am. 
And so, as I grew in my faith and in age, I realized how important it is to give to the church and give generously. Just like we have a household to support, we have a church to support. And if you have seen our impact report, which there are many of them in the lobby, it shows, and I was able to witness firsthand, that Gainesville Church impacts people locally, nationally, and internationally. And this report will actually show you that, that we do so much in the community, and we want to continue to be the hands and feet of Christ. On many occasions, you know, as parents, you think that your words were not remembered, uh, uh, they were unheeded. But I still remember our pastors telling us that our resources, we are stewards of our resources. And we will have to give account for how we spend those resources. And that's very important because in Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Our pastors have also taught us that our giving is between so and let me ask you another thing. How many of you remember these envelopes like this? Long, long ago for those of you who are younger, we used to have envelopes for our giving and every Sunday I would write my check for my offering and put it in an envelope just like this, and it had my number on it, number 1207. And I remember Pastor John used to say to me, Alvin, why don't you just give online? Because we then started online giving, and we had a kiosk in the lobby. And Pastor John would talk to me about that all the time because I was always around, we always talking. And I just kept writing those checks every Sunday. Finally, I decided I would give that a try. So I started giving online, and I never turned back. And so that demonstrates that even someone my age can change. And so I have not turned back, and I will continue to give online. And it's just one of those things where the other thing that came up to me was this. At the end of 2021, in the first month of 2022, when I looked at my giving statement, I was shocked because I set a goal for myself and it wasn't that I didn't give generously, it was that I had missed two different weeks of not giving. And so I called the church treasurer and I said, there is a mistake here. And he, checked, he said, no, there's no mistake, this is correct. And I was like, oh, but I assure you, in 2022, that didn't happen. But as I said, I had set a standard for myself for that. And so, anyway, I am an example of somebody who does believe in supporting this church. This church is very important to me, and I'm sure it's important to all of you. So I want to thank you for your generosity and encourage you to have a conversation with God, determine your level of giving, and give generously. That will allow us to continue to be the hands and feet of Christ. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Alvin. That first mission trip, it was you, me, Jackie, and Benjamin in that car. Still remember that. Let's bow our hearts and heads in prayer as the band comes up. Lord God, from what Benson said to us this morning, one of the best things that we can do is to build community. I pray over this congregation that every time they have an opportunity to gather together, like we did last night, food from around the world, over 50 people, building community, that we would see the power in truly being a church family. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I invite you to stay in church as we sing this last song together. Oh, he's our rescuer. 
He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace around. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. Sing, there's good news. There is good news for the captive. Good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the downer who more leaves and fails. Know that the Lord has come to seek and save. We sing, He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. Hey! He's our rescuer. Hey! We are free from sin forevermore. Hey! We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He is beauty. He is beauty for the blind man. He preaches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. And he is pastor for the weary. Oh, hands for those who strive. Oh, the Lord is the way of truth and life. The Lord is the way in truth and life. Oh, he's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. Hey! He's our rescuer. Hey! We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Hey! Oh, how grace will abound. Hey! We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. to do that, turn left and go be in community with each other. Have a great week. Amen.